Alrighty, I am back. Um, two quick things. One, you guys better get my subscribers up real quick because I'm damn close to doing a day in the life of a Google software engineer video, I swear. Don't make me do it. It'll be very cringy. Second of all is I have a nice big collaboration coming up with uh, a decently big YouTuber, which is sweet. So hopefully that'll get some numbers up on here, but I don't know. It's not really a huge deal at the end of the day. I'm kind of just doing this to self-study, and it's actually working out pretty well. I feel like I'm getting pretty good at this stuff. So anyway, let's go ahead and look into bloom filters, because this is something I've mentioned for a while, and I would kind of be a hypocrite if I just talked about them all the time and never explained how they actually worked. So let's go ahead and do that. All right, bloom filters, what are they? Basically, bloom filters are just another data structure that you use to approximate the contents of a set. So I've kind of mentioned that before, but um, basically they're a probabilistic algorithm that will tell you conclusively if something is um, not in the set. So basically you don't ever have to worry about false negatives. But that being said, bloom filters may basically take an element and say this could be in the set, so you may have to search this and then you have to do a little bit of unnecessary work to find out if it's actually in there. So let's go ahead and look at some use cases where bloom filters are used because I've mentioned one big one, but there's another that seems to be pretty common in a lot of large scale systems. And that is going to be cache filtering. So imagine, um, you know, maybe we're just Google and we're going to be a search index and we are going to cache a bunch of the common results of search terms that our end client might use a lot. So imagine I'm on my phone or on my laptop or something, and generally speaking, I search the term coding a lot because I'm a nerd and I've been doing a lot of research on this. My phone, like the idiot that it is, goes and thinks that I'm talking about cuddling. So first, I'm gonna search cuddling, and maybe I do search that sometimes because I'm down bad, but search cuddling, and then this thing that's gonna happen is that it's gonna go to the cache. The cache is going to see the cuddling's not in there, uh, the cache doesn't have that much space, so what's going to end up happening is it might evict a term that I use a lot more, such as coding. This is bad, obviously, I never even meant to search cuddling, but it was just an autocorrect. So how can we actually go ahead and provide some layer of protection to not basically go ahead and cache terms that I've really never searched before? This would kind of be where a bloom filter would come in. So how would we go ahead and do this? Well. First, you know, on that search term cuddling, we would go ahead and check if that is in the bloom filter. And basically, if the bloom filter says, no, it's not, it means that I personally have never searched the word cuddling before. And like I said, there are no false negatives, so the bloom filter knows that for sure. If I haven't ever searched cuddling before, it's not only not going to probably be in the cache, but more importantly, um, we don't want to go ahead and pull results from that into the cache, so we would just go ahead and reroute my request straight to the database because it's probably a pretty uncommon request, and as a result, it won't be a big deal if these uncommon requests go to the database because we're not hammering it. It's, uh, it's mostly the common requests that it's mostly important that they go to the cache because that way it stops the database from having to handle most of the load. So anyways, like I said, if that's not in the bloom filter, we go ahead and search the results for cuddling in the database or the search index or whatever it may be, but the point is we are skipping around that cache. So in this sense, bloom filters are allowing us to get better cache performance. Another common use case that I've talked about in the past are SS tables. So recall that for LSM-based storage engines, we first on reads check the LSM tree, which is an in-memory tree, like a red-black tree or something, and then we go ahead and search every single SS table in order from newest to oldest to try and see if we can go ahead and find that key. However, that's really bad because we can actually go ahead and have to search every single SS table, and actually searching an SS table means running a binary search on it because it's sorted from basically the entire bounds of the table from the beginning to the end. But what if instead we were to use bloom filters on each SS table so that we could basically very efficiently tell if a key was not in that SS table, and if so, skip over it. Obviously, we don't have an 100% success rate here. There are going to be times where the bloom filter says, well, actually, we think the key is in here, so you're still going to have to check it, and then it turns out it's not, and you go forwards. But even still, generally speaking, this saves a lot of time. So if you see my example below, basically, I would check the bloom filters for SS table 1 and 2 for the key Jordan, and hopefully the bloom filter would tell me Jordan's not in there. And as a result, I would then look at the bloom filter for SS table three. It would say Jordan might be in here, and then I would go ahead and run binary search and find my proper key. The point is though, just remember that, like I said, it's possible that the bloom filter for either SS table one or two would say that Jordan is actually in there. And if so, I would waste some time searching those tables to no avail. So why is it that bloom filters actually work this way? Well, let's go ahead and break down the algorithm for them. 
So basically the way that bloom filters work is the following. You start with a single array of m bits initialized to zeros. So bits can basically just be zeros or ones. And we have this array of length m. Okay. So now what we're going to do is choose k different hash functions. And obviously we want these to be good hash functions in the sense that they distribute our data relatively uniformly and they're random. So imagine I have the key poop. Whatever, that's what I chose. That's right, I'm not mature. Um, basically we're going to go ahead and take each of the k hash functions. So imagine here that k is 3. So I have these three hash functions and take the result of them mod m. So imagine I hashed poop three times with these three functions and the results I get are 0, 2, and m minus 1. What we're going to do is say, if I wanted to add poop to, these, uh, to this set, the bloom filter that I would use to represent this set, now I have to set all of these bits from the hashes of poop to 1. So you can, you can see now that in the array I've set the 0th bit to 1, the 2nd bit to 1, and the m minus 1th bit to 1. So this is kind of how I would go ahead and add a term. If I were to add more terms, you know, if I wanted to add p or something, I would go ahead and do the same exact hashes, and I would continue to add the bits. It would be on the same array, by the way, not a different array. So keep that in mind. We just have one array, and every single time we're adding a term, we're setting the corresponding bits in that single array. So you can see how that might be a problem later, but we'll talk about that in a bit. So now to continue the actual algorithm, we now have this set that just contains poop and we have the corresponding bits from the hashes of poop that are all set. So now imagine if I wanted to get the hash results for the key Jordan. So I would go ahead and use those same k hash functions and um, go ahead and get the results. So hash function one of Jordan uh, mod m returns zero, hash two gets two. So as you can see, Jordan and poop are actually pretty similar in the way they're hashed. Uh, you know, random, I guess, luck. But even still, the fact that hash function three mod m returns three as opposed to m minus one means that Jordan and Poop differ in one bit from those three hashes. So since the fact that filter 3 equals 0, we know that Jordan can't be in the set, because if Jordan was in the set, that bit would have been set to 1. As a result, we can basically conclusively say that we are able to basically, in, uni uh, in constant time, determine if something is in the set, and in this case, we know that Jordan is not. So now you might be thinking to yourself, well, what if we've added so many elements to the set, that um, basically we just get luck unlucky and um, you know it just so happens that bits 0, 2, and 3 have already been set to 1 and now we just think that Jordan is in the set even though it's not. Well in this case we're out of luck. So basically like I said as we add more elements to the set more of the bits in that array are going to start being set to 1's and sometimes we're going to get false positives. Um, obviously there's not really much we can do here. Um, there is math basically you know, getting values for m and k, where m is the length of that array and k are the number of hash functions, you know, to try and avoid a good number of false positives. But at the end of the day, after a while, when there are too many things in the set, occasionally we're just going to have to go ahead and reset that bloom filter to all zeros to avoid getting so many false positives, because eventually it's just going to even stop being useful. And if every single time is an error, then it doesn't even help us to go ahead and check that out. We may as well just reset it to zero, um, incur the penalty of you know having to re-add some things to the set, and then eventually start getting useful bloom filter results again. Okay, so in conclusion, bloom filters are super useful in terms of both that um, cache filtering that I mentioned and also LSM reads. Um, there's something that I've mentioned a lot, and I've put an emphasis in this channel of trying to explain every single thing that I can, you know, within reason. And so I think it's really useful to kind of be able to actually go ahead and break this down and see this technique that's used in so many modern database systems in order to greatly improve the speed of reads. In the past, I've kind of acted like this was some sort of, you know, probabilistic algorithm where, you know, it, it can almost get things wrong sometimes. And the truth of the matter is, no, it can't really get things wrong. If a bloom filter says something is not in a set, it's right about that. And so you may have to end up doing, you know, a similar amount of work because you're just going to falsely search a set for something that's not there. But it can still speed things up a lot by telling you that some element is not in the set. And that is hugely important for a variety of reasons. And I kind of went through those use cases in this video. So I think that um, being able to talk about bloom filters in a systems design interview is pretty useful. And at the end of the day, I hope this video 